This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther. You're doing what? It's Wednesday, January 20th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VU headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. It's inauguration day in the United States and amid unprecedented security, Joe Biden takes the oath of office in Washington, D.C. to begin his first term as the country's 46th president. We'll have more on the big day coming up. But first, the U.S. Embassy in Kampala says its ambassador to Uganda is being prevented from visiting opposition leader Bobby Wine at his home, which is surrounded by security forces. David Doyle reports. Uganda has accused the U.S. ambassador in the country of seeking to subvert last week's presidential election. That's after the American embassy in Kampala said Natalie E. Brown was prevented from visiting opposition leader Bobby Wine at his home, which has been surrounded by security forces since the vote. President Yoweri Museveni, in power since 1986, was declared winner of the poll, though Wine and his national unity platform want to legally challenge the results. Museveni claims the election may turn out to be the most cheating free in Uganda's history. But the U.S. Embassy has said the vote was tainted by harassment of opposition candidates, suppression of media and rights advocates, and a nationwide internet shutdown. It said Ambassador Brown visited Wine's compound to try and check on his health and safety. But government spokesman of Wano Opondo claimed, without providing evidence, that Ambassador Brown has a track record of causing trouble in countries where she worked. But what she has been trying to do blatantly yeah. is to meddle yeah. in Uganda's internal politics, particularly election, yeah. Yeah. to subvert yeah. our election yeah. and the will of the people. The public rebuke to the United States is relatively unusual, as the two nations are allies. Washington supports Ugandan soldiers serving in an African Union peacekeeping mission in Somalia and has donated about $1.5 billion to Uganda's health sector in the past three years. Troops have prevented wine, real name Robert Chigalani, from leaving his home since he returned from voting on Thursday. On Tuesday, he said he and his wife have run out of food and milk for their niece. Her father has been refused entry to collect the 18-month-old, wine wrote on Twitter. A police spokesman said a motorcycle courier had delivered food to Wine's house each day. On Tuesday, Wine's lawyers filed a petition in the High Court, challenging the legality of detaining Wine and his wife without charge. Well, does David Doyle filed that report. The withdrawal of U.S. troops who trained Somalia's elite forces is raising concerns about security and stability in the country. But Somali officials and analysts note that the country can still count on the U.S. air power against Al-Shabaab militants. Mohamed Kahir reports from Mogadishu. Somali Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Rolle and senior defense officials in his government toured Balidogle Air Base south of the capital Mogadishu to show their appreciation to American forces before they scheduled withdrawal from the Horn of African Nation. The security cooperation between the United States and Somali forces significantly reduced the threats posed by the Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab and Mogadishu hopes the military assistance will continue even after the pullout. We believe that the withdrawal of the U.S. troops is not based on a permanent decision. Neither is it the end of security and military cooperation, but rather normal technical maneuvers. Our cooperation with Washington has been strengthening in the past years in various areas, and we hope to continue enhancing that significant assistance. The U.S. security support to Somalia mainly in form of airstrikes that targeted al-Shabaab leaders and gatherings has significantly reduced the hit-and-run attacks by al-Shabaab fighters against African peacekeepers in the country and Somali politicians. However, the security analysts believe the pullout will give the militants a great chance to launch fresh attacks on their international targets.
If there will be no immediate replacement, the withdrawal of U.S. troops will not only affect the Somali security agencies, especially the elite force DANAB that was provided with training, but also AU peacekeepers in the country, which depend heavily on U.S. air power in al-Shabaab active regions in the south of the country. With presidential and parliamentary elections slated for early next month, Somali authorities are ramping up security to guard against any possible attacks by al-Shabaab after American troops leave. Terrorism is not the only threat to our region. It's a global threat which needs international response that fills the gap left behind and we hope the new U.S. president will renew Washington's security role in Somalia. The approximately 700 U.S. troops in Somalia are expected to leave the country by end of this month. However, the U.S. Defense Department has said many will be repositioned in nearby countries and could take part in cross-border operations. Mohamed Kahir for VOA News in Mogadishu, Somalia. Dr. Olwajoba Oroge is bracing for the week ahead. Another long line of coronavirus patients at Abuja's EHA clinic and another long wait for news of a vaccine. Loren Anthony reports. Medics at Abuja's EHA clinic in Nigeria are exhausted. They're facing long lines of coronavirus patients and another long wait for news of a vaccine. Though Europe has been inoculating its people since December, African health authorities say it could be weeks, even months, until they get their first shots. Dr. Oluwajoba Oroge says cases are mounting every day, stocks of PPE are dwindling, and he and his colleagues are feeling increasingly drained. The cases will continue to rise if we don't have a vaccine to stem things, a vaccine to even produce, to um, give us some herd immunity. So that continues to mean more work stress, more mental stress, more stress on all the resources that um, I as an individual and the facility has to offer. It's not just patients' lives at risk. More than 2,600 Nigerian doctors have contracted COVID-19 and dozens of them have died. Dr. Adetunji Adenakon, chairman of the Nigerian Medical Association's Lagos branch, as doctors are even leaving the country due to the strain. We have depleted numbers even before this COVID-19 pandemic through brain drain. And even during this pandemic, a lot of doctors have left the shores of this country. So we are depleted every day by the minute. And yet we are combating a lot of cases, as you see that, uh, as, is, as it is now that the cases are rising. Last month, the country's health minister said he hoped to see the first vaccines arriving through the global COVAX scheme in January. But he gave no precise timings and made no mention of which shot Nigeria would get. African states have accused richer regions of cornering most of the supplies. World Health Organization head Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said on Monday that the world was on the brink of catastrophic moral failure when it came to sharing out shots. Privately, some doctors are worried that when vaccines do arrive in Nigeria, they will go first to the rich and powerful. That was Lauren Anthony of Reuters reporting. Countries worldwide are expecting renewed ties with America as Joe Biden begins his first term as the 46th president of the United States. The continent of Africa is no exception and will be seeking even stronger ties with the U.S. under Biden, a man who has visited the continent on numerous occasions and whom they see as a friend. For more insight, I spoke to Ngozi Bell, an African economic and political analyst, and began by asking her, what Africa's relationship with the Biden administration might look like. I, I think we have to look historically at what Africa's relationship in general needs to be in this kind of time. Uh, the truth is Africa by 2035 will have the youngest working uh, group on the planet, right? This is a trend that will continue for the rest of the future. By 2030, 43% of Africans will join the global ranks of middle class and upper class categorization. So what that tells us is that with a combined um, 
uh, spending in 2030 of about 6.7 trillion. This is all new money, all new markets, all new consumers, all new developers, all new construction, all new technology, all new services, all new retail, all new manufacturing. Cooperation with Africa ought to be every wise continent strategic priority. Given the negative impact of COVID-19 on global economies right now, should Africa seek an even greater or stronger economic tie with America during Biden's presidency? COVID-19 uh, really ravaged uh, the globe. But quite honestly, what it did to Africa versus what it did to the U.S. is vastly different. Africa has worked out a strategy, mostly working with European companies like AstraZeneca to ultimately get its vaccine um, uh, strategy sorted out. So given all this, Africa should seek agreements that are balanced and sufficiently beneficial to Africa's growing economy and population and be focused in growth areas that are most important to Africa's agenda. But what I call an equivalent relationship is when Africa gets what it needs and what it wants without a detriment to the U.S. and vice versa. Ngozi, how should African governments then, and especially businesses, prepare to engage with America for that optimum economic benefit? African governments and businesses must recognize the strength and opportunity that they wield in this hour, right? But they must use it judiciously, right? They must use it to foster what I call equitable engagements with America. What that means is African governments must make sure that the banking um, sector, for example, and the financial institutions are well capitalized so that African businesses, NGOs, and governments can engage with the U.S. infrastructure. Uh, we still know that whether we like it or not, five of the 10 world's fastest economies or growing economies are still in Africa. You know, if this was a chess game, Africa would be a check, about to do a checkmate. And I don't say that to uh, pump up Africa. What I'm trying to say, Esther, is that with opportunities like this, Africa must be particular about sectors to pursue and to go big on. So, for example, things that alleviate poverty, things that help Africans move more into the middle class and above, things that ensure baseline health care and access to all. Ngozi, we rarely see diversity for top government officials, even in most countries around the world. But Biden speaks appear to differ. Today, we know that diversity and inclusion is the true cornerstone of any democracy. Biden has an opportunity to propel America's democracy, making it synonymous with his growth strategy, making it synonymous with his uh, desire to get the world to see America as America really should be. There's no better way to kind of define it for his vice president, right? To have uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, who is African-American, who is a woman, who is Indian-American. So that says a lot. Then you look at what he's done with Michael Reagan, who is looking to lead EPA. We have Susan Rice, who is the domestic uh, policy advisor. We have Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is the UN ambassador. I think Biden understands this, that diversity and inclusion is fundamental to the protection of the democracy of, our, of, of the United States. And certainly as a leader in the world, making sure that the leaders that he puts at the cabinet level are truly diverse and it truly is inclusive. Ngozi Bell is an African economic and political analyst and a partner with Trans-Sahara Investment Corporation. Welcome back to Africa 54. U.S. allies are expressing optimism for the future bilateral relations ahead of the inauguration of Joe Biden. But despite the warm words, there are potential obstacles ahead. Henry Ridgewell has more from London. The inauguration of Joe Biden represents not only a new chapter for America, but for the world, for allies and adversaries alike. New relationships with the world's superpower are already taking shape. In Europe, there is a mood of optimism. The climate agenda, uh, global trade policy, uh, multilateral institutions and European security are, are very much on the top of the agenda of um, of, of European leaders when it comes to talking to, uh, to Joe Biden. Jill told me not to become emotional. I'm but there could be a big hurdle ahead. China. The European Union has agreed in principle to an investment agreement with China, despite concerns over Beijing's trade practices and human rights abuses. Europe doesn't see China as a geopolitical peer competitor, not the way the U.S. does. 
As Vice President under Barack Obama, Biden forged good relations with European allies. But in the past four years, many Europeans have begun to question their reliance on America, says Korterweg. They think they need to develop their own so-called strategic autonomy. The Americans will insist by saying, look, we're back, we're at the head of the table again. Please, please follow us. And it's going to be, it's going to require trust building and good choreography to ensure that the Americans and the Europeans don't end up at loggerheads over such an important issue as how to deal with China. Meanwhile, European trade with the US is stumbling. Under President Trump, the United States and Europe slapped tariffs on some imports of each other's goods. At the top of the agenda will be to um, clearly uh, say stop to the trade war between the US and Europe. Stop to the sanctions from uh, the US administration on uh, French vineyards, for instance. Stop to the Boeing Airbus case, which is uh, clearly not in the interest of neither the US nor European countries. Britain has traditionally been seen as the transatlantic bridge between the US and Europe. But London's ties to the EU have been cut by Brexit. So when it comes to trade issues, or perhaps also climate change, or areas of uh, economic regulation or dealing with financial crises. Um, the United Kingdom is not going to be America's first port of call. Still, Britain remains a key security partner. Foreign Minister Dominic Raab said Tuesday reviving the Iran nuclear deal or JCPOA from which the US withdrew in 2018 is a top priority. It is welcome that President-elect Biden uh, and the new administration has talked about coming back into the JCPOA, enhancing and strengthening it. The coronavirus pandemic has brought health and economic crises to both Europe and the United States. In the near term, dealing with that domestic emergency will likely take priority on both sides of the Atlantic. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. On this inauguration day, the White House is being cleared of the Trump family's belongings while preparing for its newest residence in just six hours. Viewers Dora McQua speaks with a woman who has an insider's view of moving day at the White House. On inauguration day, it's just organized chaos. There's only about six hours uh, available to you to move one family out and move another family in. Everybody is working that in those six hours to make the house a home for the new first family when they walk in. Anita McBride has worked for three presidential administrations. She was chief of staff to First Lady Laura Bush. McBride knows firsthand what President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden can expect on day one. When they come in to the White House for the first time, after traditionally the inaugural parade, all their clothes are hanging in the closet. All of their personal photos are out in the places where they wanted them to be. It is really an amazing transfer. The transformation is carefully choreographed. The incoming first family will have already chosen furnishings and artwork from the White House's extensive collection, which is stored in a Maryland warehouse. As incoming First Lady Michelle Obama discovered during a pre-inauguration visit with Laura Bush. Mrs. Obama had remarked just how beautiful everything was. And so all that she knew she had to worry about uh, for when they first moved in is having her girls' rooms, her little girls' rooms, decorated so that they would be kid-friendly. The incoming president makes choices about how to furnish the Oval Office. Most presidents choose to use the HMS Resolute Desk, given to President Rutherford B. Hayes by Queen Victoria in the late 1800s. Interestingly enough, the rug really has a role to play to conveying the feeling that a president has or the emotions that they have about sitting in that office. Of course, the portrait of George Washington always has its prominent place above the fireplace and virtually no one has changed that. 
It's a day when emotions can run high. Well, the relationship between a permanent staff and a first family, and particularly if there are children involved and young children involved, they do become quite close. And it's, uh, it's hard for them to say goodbye. Leaving the White House can be especially difficult for a one-term president. You feel a sense of, I didn't get everything done the way that I had hoped. So when you're leaving after four years, and particularly for a, a first family, it is emotional. And, and you know, George H.W. Bush did say in his, in his memoirs and said it hurt. It hurt. And Barbara, Barbara Bush felt it too. And the family felt it um, deeply. But they also are incredible patriots, and they rose to the occasion. The goodbyes can also be challenging for staff members who look after the first family's pets, like veteran staffer Dale Haney. He is in charge of the grounds, but he also has had the responsibility of taking care of any family pet. And it's, very, it's been a difficult uh, experience for him on moving day when the pets that he's gotten so close to who are like his family um, when they leave with the first family. Curators make sure White House valuables don't mistakenly walk out the door with an outgoing first family. They know every single thing that belongs to the White House collection. They also know every single thing that is yours personally. And so all of these items are all individually tagged. Which helps make moving day at the White House as seamless as possible. Dora McQuar, VOA News, Washington. In our tech news, since 2015, the Heart Lab Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Temagana, has been empowering the youth for future digital jobs through skills development, boot camps, mentorship programs, coaching, internships, and more importantly, job placement across Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and India. Africa 54 technology correspondent Paul Diho spoke to Foster Akubri, a Ghanaian social entrepreneur, founder, and Heart Lab Foundation president in Accra. Foster Akugri, uh, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here, and Happy New Year. Uh, Happy New Year to you too, sir, and uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Right away, let's start off by maybe uh, you talking about uh, what you do at Hakalaba Foundation. You are arguably one of the rising stars uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, you've created a platform that uh, has helped uh, millions of uh, young people who want to get into uh, the technology space. Uh, maybe let's start there. We live in an in a uh, an equal world where not everyone has that opportunity and access to very, very connected and well-resourced people, um, creating a level playing field where there's less bias or is, is almost absolutely unbiased, creates an opportunity for people to compete based on their talents because talent is equally distributed but uh, opportunity isn't. And so the purpose of the Hack Lab Foundation and my life's mission is to help people find their path by creating that level playing field for them. A lot of people talk about you as somebody who could be uh, the next uh, uh, Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, how did you come up uh, with uh, this, uh, 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 this program here? Interesting. That's... That's quite a benchmark to, to compare me to, but uh, I appreciate that I am seeing uh, towards that light, and it's positive, so yeah, I acknowledge and accept it in good faith. Um, so the Heart Lab Foundation started five years ago, somewhat somewhere in 2015, uh, just as an idea and as a single one-time event, which was to bring together uh, innovative students to, to develop their own solutions with support from a number of tech firms who were now emerging and breaking into the market with fintech solutions. Today, our community has grown to uh, 10,700 people. Uh, we have placed people in jobs. In the last two years, we've placed over 700 people in jobs. We have um, We have designed a number of other initiatives 
that is centered around uh, uh, transitioning young people between the ages of 7 to 15 into uh, uh, technology and uh, technology education, into building their careers in technology, and we call that the Hack Lab Junior. And so we want to help expose the young people to technology and kind of give them the opportunity to know what exists. Let's talk about uh, the other programs uh, that you're working on. Uh, take, for example, uh, AI or artificial intelligence. You're big on that. Help us understand what AI is all about. This year, we are focused on artificial intelligence. So every year, we choose one of the fourth industrial revolution technologies or the emerging technologies. And all our initiatives, programs, training programs, advocacy, policy, everything we do, hackathons, are focused on that particular theme. In 2021, we are focused on artificial intelligence. Now, the applications of artificial intelligence is currently immeasurable. We, are, we can't even tell where and where it can't be used. We'll be interfacing with each other. I will be speaking my Ghanaian dialect, and you will be speaking English. But by the time you finish speaking your English, I have heard it in my local dialect. And by the time I finish speaking my local dialect, you've heard it in English. And it is happening seamlessly. And we are having a conversation as if we were both speaking the same language. And that is the power of artificial intelligence, right? Today, artificial intelligence has broken into things like it's being applied into the augmented reality, virtual reality, which is allowing people to experience things firsthand as if they were right in front of them, but they are hundreds of thousands of miles away. And that is what globalization is all about, creating a global village powered by technology, but driven by artificial intelligence. And all these things can only be powerful if we have the right data collection tools. And that is the basis for which artificial intelligence would become the biggest technology we have ever seen. Well, uh, Foster, thank you so much uh, for your time. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time as well and the opportunity to share our story. That was Africa 54 technology correspondent Paul Diho speaking to Foster Akugri, founder and president of the Heart Lab Foundation in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch. Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.